have a lot to cover tonight. There's, as usual, a ton going on. Last night, I played an excerpt from a very provocative, chilling video entitled How It Will Go Down for Most of Us. And I mentioned last night that the video reminded me of a 1950s era sci-fi end of the world movie, maybe black and white. And if any of you are film buffs, you may remember The Last Man on Earth. I think it was 1957 starring Vincent Price. And it had to do with a, a plague that wiped out virtually everyone. And Vincent Price was the, the last man. Very interesting, very dark. How it will go down. And I had some comments from people last night. It was, it was quite compelling. We have it up listed with our first guest tonight. He is Stefan Verstappen, who is back. He's, he was on the program once before several years ago and produced this and sent it to me a couple of weeks ago. And I listened to it. And it's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. It is compressed. Uh, it's certainly not a major motion picture. It's about a 20 some minutes long, but it will get you thinking. Now today, in a corollary note, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, advises all Americans, all Americans, should immediately prepare to be without electricity for six months. Now think about that. What does that mean? And why is DHS making that recommendation? We know that less than 1% of Americans are really prepped, preppers. It's, it's that bad. So I would urge all of you to take that warning. I've got the, the story posted up at rents.com. It's right there for you. Read it. Understand that DHS doesn't play games. They must have an idea that someone, and we know the Chinese have been into our, our deepest recesses, of our entire electric grid, that they could shut the whole thing down anytime in retaliation. They would say, we didn't do it. Of course, it'd be always plausible deniability, but the electricity could go out for months. And the Department of Homeland Security is recommending that everybody have supplies on hand to survive six months without electricity. They tell it. Remember, they tell us what's going to happen in advance. In many cases, you better you better pay attention. And I'll I'll take this moment to point to one of my sponsors, Numana.com. Numana has the best, without question, food storage line in America. And if you're going to buy your family a, a Christmas present or a holiday present, however you want to celebrate the holidays, what a wonderful Christmas present it would be to buy your family, let's just say three months worth of food and supplies and water. That's about the greatest gift I can imagine uh, a loving parent or parents giving their family. Six months better. Remember the shelf life on Numana Foods is, is over 20 years. You can always cycle it through your normal everyday diet and replace it as needed, but Please think about preparing. That story from DHS is not the first I've seen, but it caught my attention and gave me a real moment of concern, especially in light of having listened to Stefan's video last night. Now, I did stop it last night before the end. We're going to play a little bit more this evening with Stefan and have him comment on it as well. Stefan, welcome back to the program, first of all. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. It's always a pleasure and an honor. Indeed. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, what got you? What got you thinking about this scenario, and that you should write it and record it? And it's done in in such a way. The way you deliver it is is uh, is very compelling. <laughs> What's behind <laughs> this? Tell us what uh, what motivated you. Well, I am flattered, Jeff. I'm very flattered. And I'm really flattered that you got that it was a 50s uh, sci-fi um, vibe to it, because that's where I was going with it. That's what I wanted to try ah, and get. Something like a, um, a Twilight Zone episode. There you or, go. Yeah. Or The Outer Limits, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. And so, well, why did I come up with this? Uh, because we're we're running out of time, Jeff, and um, there's not enough people that are ready for this. And nobody's you know, ready for it, Stefan. Nobody. Uh -huh. Nobody's ready for it. They're just in time shoppers. The trucks bring everything. The, the supermarkets have no inventory of food in the back room. These aren't the old days. When those shelves are gone, they're gone. They bring trucks the next day to refill them, basically. So, yeah, nobody's prepared. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the key lesson I want people to take away from this, in, in, in part two, I'll have the solutions, but, but I want to give the solution right now to all your listeners, and that is you can't wait until it starts to collapse because it's too late. You won't be able to escape the consequences. Right. You can prevent all this stuff. You can survive, you know, what's coming and short of, you know, thermonuclear war or common... Uh, you know, extinction level impact. Right. But <clears throat> for the scenario in this video, and there's other scenarios too, it could be a pandemic, it could be uh, a grid failure, you know. Anyways, it would all end the same way with a lot of people dead. And, but it, it's actually very easy to prevent all this. It's, it's not rocket science. It's, and it's not a lot of money, but you have to do it now. You you need at least a three month lead in time to get ready for this, and then you can survive. But if you wait, you know I get that all the time. Well, you know um, it hasn't happened yet, and I'm sure everybody will pull together when it does. No, 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 it'll be too late then, and there'll be no escape. I mean, well, for a few people that are really tough and or maybe ruthless. So why did I make this? It's my last effort, Jeff to, uh, you know, wake people up. And, you know, I've been a survivor, survivalist long before preppers came around. There were us people, and we called ourselves survivalists, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh, and, sure. uh, you know, we knew how to live out in the woods. Uh, we had first aid skills. We had firearm skills. We had cooking skills, you know. Um, you know how to use a ham radio. So I've been at this for, you know, 45 years. And then I've also been a conspiracy theorist as well. You know, I, I knew Kennedy was uh, not shot by Lee Harvey Oswald when I was 15. You know, how about, how about conspiracy researcher? You're not a theorist. These things are real. You're a researcher like I am and like many of our listeners are. Absolutely, because if, if people understand how the world works, everything is a conspiracy. It's it's not a theory. They all, there's always evil, sinister characters plotting some, you know, dastardly deed. That, that's you know, read any part of history for the last four thousand years. It's all been a conspiracy theory. Now, nothing but, is left to chance. I want to underscore that. I do it often. Nothing of any significance is left to chance, and anything of any consequence that might arise from populism or nationalism is immediately penetrated, co-opted, and taken over. Absolutely. By you-know-who, all right? Yes, I do. Those whose names must not be spoken. Um, yeah, and, you know, just an aside, this is why I believe in a leaderless revolution because as soon as you organize you're going to be subverted penetrated infiltrated you know anyways so that's a whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Now, that's a very good point very good point anytime a demagogue or a hero arises to lead the masses uh that should alarm you a, a leaderless revolution is the only valid legitimate one that that can't be co-opted Think about that. That's very interesting. Yeah, no, uh, and and I've been fighting the leaderless revolution my whole life. I, you know, I boycott companies that I know are part of the, you know, the new world order. I speak to people where whenever I get, I mean, I talk to the cashier at the grocery store, you know, and uh, talk about, uh, you know, the way the world is. And I especially have a good time with the bank tellers because I always tell them, you do know you work for the most evil institution in the country, right? <laughs> they are, they are, they are all, so many of them are very nice, but my God, are they dumb. And I don't mean dumb in a negative sense, just uninformed dumb. They just don't yeah. get it. You know, I said, I don't mean that you're evil, but you do understand that your bosses are evil. <laughs> I used to ask my bank manager, what do you know about the Federal Reserve? Nothing. About central banks? 
Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. No. No, I, I used to be good friends with my old bank manager, Luke Solda. He ended up uh, quitting the banking business and opening a pizza parlor. <laughs> but, good for, good uh, for Luke. Yeah. Good for Luke. Uh, and a great guy. That's why I quit the banking business. But they didn't know anything. No. No, no. So, as part of the, uh, you know, and then 9-11 Truth, I've been part of that, you know. Uh, I knew it was an inside job. And I'm not saying this to prove how smart I am or whatever, but the day I saw and I watched it live, I was in California up on the mountain in Ojai, and uh, my wife woke me up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, you got to, something big's happening. So we watched it live. When that first tower came down into its own footprint, I went, no, no. That, that could never happen. Not a chance. Not a chance. I mean, I, why? Am I a design engineer? No. You know, I'm just, I just have common sense and, and woodworking skills, you know. I, I'm pretty good at fixing things. It could not come down in its own footprint. So then quickly, through my mind, what am I going through? Well, the terrorists must have wired the demolition, right? Right. But they would have to be on every single floor. How are terrorists going to, you know, put uh, uh, explosives on every floor and not be noticed? So then I went, well, it wasn't terrorists then. It was somebody else that put those explosives in. And then when the second building came down in its own footprint, it's like lightning striking twice in the same spot. Mm -hmm. I mean, the odds of that happening are so far-fetched. And then building seven, you know, it's like... To me, what it was is the New World Order saying, yeah, 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 yeah. See if you can figure it out. What are you going to do about it? I mean, it's just in your face. It's so obvious. So I've been part of this movement for a long time. And here's what I hear from everybody in the movement. Um, I tried to wake my brother-in-law up. I tried to wake my family up. I tried to make wake my friends up. And nobody wants to listen to me. And... So what we end up doing, and for a long time, is preaching to the choir. You know, we're always talking to other conspiracy theorists because we can't talk to our families. But, you know, it, we're at the point now where it's really crucial. And there's, if we're going to change things, we need to get 20% on our side. And this is uh, called the Pareto Principle, which states that only 20% of any population is going to affect any kind of a change. The other 80% just follow along. Now, <clears throat> your listening audience and, 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 and the people that I know and can talk to, what percentage of the population do we make up, Jeff? 5%? Maybe. Maybe, right? If we can get 20% on our side, like woke up, knowing what's going on, then... We have a chance to change things. We have a chance to make things better. But we don't have 20%. We can, so we have to reach out beyond ourselves. So, okay, I know. You can't talk to the brother-in-law. You can't talk to your parents. You can't talk to your uh, kids. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. And so what I have tried to do with my videos and writing for the last 10 years is cross over to the people that are not conspiracy theorists already or researchers that are not survivalists already because you know the more people we can save the easier it'll be for the rest of us you know it'd be great if everybody in my neighborhood had uh, six months supply of food and excellent idea for christmas get them three months supply of food forget about the new iphone forget about another video game Get them the three months supply of food. That's the best Christmas present you can give them because that will give them a chance to survive what's coming. Right. So <clears throat> I'm trying to cross over. So as you know, Jeff, the first question every writer asks himself is, who is your audience? And my audience for this video are not the listeners of the Jeff Rents program because those people that listen to your regularly and i've been listening to you for 20 years for those people that listen to you regularly they already know this stuff they are aware of the central bank system and the fiat currency and you know how quickly they can implode the market and the threats we face from inside our own government the betrayal of the traders they know all this stuff so this video is just going to 
I meant it as a tool that they can send the brother-in-law, mm-hmm. that they can play for their parents. Because it's, you know, we make a mistake among us preppers and stuff when we talk to people that, you know, are not woke. And we want to give them everything at once. You know, oh, by the way, you're a slave to the monetary system. Psychopaths rule the world. Um, you know, um, these people don't want to hear that. It scares them too much. They right. just don't want to hear it. So the minute you start talking about, well, you know, if there's a social collapse or the power goes out for six months or the currency uh, it becomes worthless, uh, what will you do? They don't want to hear that. So I thought, I'll tell this story from the point of view of average middle class American family living the American dream and take you step by step how quickly it can go from the American dream to the destruction of the entire family. And yes, it's condensed to 20 minutes and in the video, you know, period of six weeks and everybody says, well, it can't happen that fast. Oh, yeah, I can. Oh, yeah. It oh, can you happen. bet it can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You could wake yeah, you could wake up tomorrow, go check your bank account and everything's been shut down. Now what are you gonna do? Go to the store, they won't accept your credit cards, they'll only accept cash. How much cash do you have on hand? Oh, and by the way, all the prices have gone up three hundred percent. I mean it can happen very fast. So the criticism I've gotten from the video and I've gotten quite a bit. But one of them is oh it couldn't happen that fast, but no, it could happen that fast. But so <clears throat> Well I'll, let me say it again. When the trucks, if the trucks stop running, you got no food, ladies and gentlemen. You have nothing. If you bought it, a truck brought it. Okay? And if the trucks stop, for whatever reason, you're done. Uh, I mean, an EMP pulse, for example, would take us back 100, 150 years. Uh, just think about it. No more computers. Yeah, gone. No, I, I, I've seen it happen several times. You know, we had power blackouts, and people are living in you know uh, sixty-story condominiums. Mm-hmm. Elevator. How are you going to get food up there? Mm-hmm. You're going to you're going to carry you know ten gallons of water, which is your minimum requirement for a family of five, up you know <laughs> sixty flights of stairs, and and at the same time, all the stores shut down because. Without electricity, they can't process payments, so they're not selling. Oh, no they, electricity. First thing they do, step on is, is uh, lock the doors. First exactly. Thing. Yeah, they lock the doors. So, um, and this happened because of a, a silly thunder shower. I mean, we're not even talking EMP. It was just a, a freak storm mm-hmm. dumped, like, you know, uh, 12 inches of water in uh, two hours. Flooded yeah, the generator. Yeah. Everything shut down. Yeah. Well... There's no phone, there's no elevator, there's no electricity, there's no going to the store, <laughs> there's no air conditioning. It was like, you know, it was like 30 degrees and humid. Um, everything shut down and nobody has an option now, you know. I, when, you, when, you, when you, excuse me, when you yeah. wrote this and you did condense it, I mean, you could have spun this out to two hours easily, but you did a marvelous job of including all the critical turning points. And exactly how it will go down. And that's the title, How It Will Go Down. It's all there. Uh, if you look under Stefan's name and guests and just go there at your convenience later tonight or tomorrow and do share this. Uh, and I do hope you'll prepare. We've been doing this program for 25 years now. And the website's been in service for over 23 years of uh, bringing you the best possible news and information we can. Y- you all know. Those of you who are readers and listeners, you understand, you get it. And I think that's why this video had such an impact, just listening to it. So we have a break coming up in about a minute, and we'll take that break. And after the break, we're going to play a little bit more of this and talk to Stefan further about, uh, about being prepared. Being prepared. It's not hard to do. Why don't more people do it? The word is denial. They just don't think it's going to happen to them. And what a terrible mistake that is. It happens to everybody, unless you're in the 1%. And even those people are going to get stuck sooner or later. Uh, When the phones go out, when the gasoline is no longer available, 
and you sell your $20,000 car for 250 bucks cash because cash is king all of a sudden again. It's all in the, it's all in Stefan's story, how it will go down. And it's, it's must listening. And I think preaching to the choir, yes. Uh, even this choir, though, is not fully prepared. I, would, I wouldn't even know how to project a guess at what percentage of all of you listening are prepared and ready. It's, it's certainly way above the norm in this country. But we have an audience worldwide, both the site and the program. And wherever you are, this applies equally to, to all of you people as well, not just those in North America. This is a crucial issue. Prepare now more than ever. You know if you've been following the stories that we put up for you to read, Trump is in trouble. The entire government is in trouble. It no longer represents the will of the people. It's not our servant anymore. It serves the corporatocracy, international globalism, big business, whatever you want to call it, and above all, the banking cartel. They don't give a damn about us. We are nothing. The value of human life to those alleged people is zero. We're just numbers and digits in their software inventory and portfolio. That's it. All right, hold on just a minute. Uh, Stefan and I will be right back. We'll play a little bit more of how it will go down right after this. Back to business here. Uh, Stefan Verstappen is our guest tonight, this first hour. And I'm going to go back to the, uh, the video. I've got it set up, I think, right where you want. So any intro uh, do you want to do? Well, this is at the very end of the video. Uh, it's, it's really depressing, but it's the events that lead up to the end, how fast it can happen to you right. and how innocuous it all starts off as. It's, it's you know, you, you, you get a slight feeling that something might be going wrong and boom, bang, the next minute, you know, you're wiped out. What a drop. 20 minutes straight down. It's just uh, it's it's quite remarkable, uh, extremely uh, realistic in so many ways and all all viable. These aren't just sci fi things. These are all viable. Every well, development I've lived in it. through all those events, Jeff, I've yeah. lived through them and I even came close a couple of times to committing suicide, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, there'll be a lot. There'll be a lot of those. Yeah, I know. And, and and then if you don't, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, it can't happen here. What do you mean it can't happen here? It's already happened and it's happening now. Go to the nearest overpass. Look underneath. You see all those tents? Those are homeless people. You think they got there because they wanted to be there? You know, it's because, you know, the breadwinner of the family got sick and they couldn't afford the medical bills. And now they're out of the house, they're out of everything, and they're living under the goddamn overpass. It's happening now. Yeah. Uh, we've shown uh, video of downtown Los Angeles, for example, mile after mile, uh, the sidewalks just covered with tents, uh, black plastic coverings for people to live under, allegedly. Tens of yeah. thousands of homeless. California is, is essentially gone. I we, know. We're, I, I lived we're there for trouble. 12 years, Jeff. Yeah. And, you know, from L.A. to San Francisco and mostly in Ventura County. But even in I Ventura am from Santa Barbara. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got friends in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. I used to go up there all the time and uh, bicycle down the mountain there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You mean 154? Um, oh, yeah. A dirt bike on bike paths. Or did you even yes. go down 154? Oh, okay. All right. No, I, no, I only ride a, a, a mountain bike. Yeah, I, I've ridden good. all through the mountains up there, you know, Malibu and... Uh-huh, uh uh-huh. Oh, you know oh. the country very well. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful country up there, you know. No, it's, it's very pretty. We are in a drought situation here, again, uh, artificial drought. We've had a few rain fronts come through, but there's no rain in them. I think we might have had an, an inch of rain the last two months. Should have started in September. I'm up in the northwest now, so but it's, ba it's bad. All right, here we go. Let's uh, cue this up. Uh, I've got it right, I think, and we will uh, play several minutes of this for you. And you're welcome to listen to the whole thing anytime at all. And please do. And don't forget, share it. Here we go. When he arrived home, there was an eviction notice on the front door. Mom was found rocking back and forth with her remaining child held in her arms. 
She was silent, her face frozen in despair. Dad buried middle daughter in the backyard. Then he loaded the minivan with clothes, blankets, and sleeping bags, some camping supplies, and what little food they had left. Dad picked up Mom and carried her to the van, with the little boy following behind. Dad told Mom that they had to be strong and survive. They still had a young son to take care of, and that eldest daughter will be okay and find her way back to them soon. But Mom said nothing and continued to stare out the window. Dad stapled a note on the front door in case his eldest daughter came home, saying, We have gone to the overpass homeless camp. Look for our van. Love, Dad. Before they left, Dad found Betsy the dog, dead, curled up on her favorite blanket in the kitchen near her anti-food bowl. He buried her next to his daughter. They drove to the designated homeless area where there were hundreds of cars, campers, trucks, and tents under the overpass. They slowly drove along the overpass looking for a spot to park, passing dozens of open fires surrounded by people huddling for warmth. Dad cooked some instant noodles on the propane stove and put on a brave face for Mom and his son and told them so long as they stick together as a family, everything will be all right. Mom didn't reply and continued to stare into the distance. Dad was also worried for his son since he had become increasingly afraid and had developed a tremor and often burst into tears and would cry for hours and Dad's efforts to comfort him were in vain. Week six. Three days later, the emergency food truck arrived and Dad was disappointed to discover that his ration pack consisted of three packs of instant noodles and three hot dogs. As he walked back to the van, he could smell barbecued meat coming from several of the campfires. When he went to find out where the meat came from, he was told it was the family dog, or cat, or a pigeon someone had caught. Dad cooked up the noodles and put all three hot dogs in the pot, since they hadn't eaten in two days. Then he took his Colt 45 and headed into the nearby ravine, determined to shoot a raccoon, or a squirrel, or maybe a goose. Dad walked through the ravine until dusk without even seeing an animal of any kind. Dad was determined to go out again the next day and find something to kill. When he returned to the van, he discovered that men had come while he was gone and stole his camping equipment and sleeping bags. His son was curled up in a fetal position, hiding under the van. Mom was sitting in the front seat, staring out the window. That night, they put on all the clothes they had and huddled together for warmth in the van. Mom and Dad could not sleep because of the fear, anxiety, and hunger they felt. In the early morning, a gang of armed men came to rob the homeless camp of anything of value. Some of the homeless had firearms and fired shots to defend themselves. But the gang was heavily armed and sprayed the camp indiscriminately with gunfire, killing dozens of people. A stray bullet pierced the side of the van and went through the young boy and mom, killing both instantly. Clutching the bodies of his wife and son close to him, dad watched the son come up and then went to bury his family in the ravine. After he was done, he put the barrel of his Colt 45 to his temple, and his last words before pulling the trigger was, I am so sorry. We could cut it there. Yeah, uh, if you want to play some more, we can, but I thought that was a, a good place to stop. Yeah, I know. Stop it there. That's the end, uh, pretty much. So, yeah, very depressing. But, you know, this is what families in America are going through right now. 
the uh, the suicide rate in America was at its highest point during the Great Depression, mm-hmm. and it's never reached that point until now. You know, the, the it has rate, it has matched. I didn't know this. It has matched that of the Great Depression. It has now matched that of the Great Depression. This is what the you know the strain of living under this monetary system has done to people. I mean, it's destroyed our country, it's destroyed our community, it's destroying our families, and you know, all this, uh, you know, I have a video out, Why We Are Poor, where I show very clearly that 80% of everything you earn and spend goes to taxes. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, well, it's 40%. No, that's just your income tax. It's not state tax, it's not road tax, it's not property tax, it's not hidden tax and 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 everything else in between you know a driver's license is a tax you know uh, and and all the other licenses you need and the cost of compliance it adds up to 80 85 percent of everything the government is sucking it away from you and that's why people are going insane that's why our our society is collapsing that's why the suicide rate as it skyrocketed but you know the other thing that we don't take into account you know we think about all the people that kill themselves and and are homeless and all that but the drug addiction the alcoholism and then the broken families that things you don't hear about they're hidden by the msm they won't tell us they don't they keep that well out of sight yeah I know a lot of families destroyed. I, I, I have a very good friend in St. Louis. He deals with, uh, he's a drug uh, intake counselor. You know, you know, even here in Canada, my God, every small town, uh, and I mean, we're talking rural, you know, Eskimo towns across the country is dealing with a major meth and opioid addiction problem. It's, it's huge. People are ODing. People are destroying their lives with these drugs. Mm-hmm. Why? Because of this stress, our society is so poisonous, it's so miserable that everybody is drinking themselves to death and drugging themselves if they're not shooting themselves. Um, You know, that's what this is all from, you know. So, um, Stefan, today in the market, just as an aside, I watched people uh, with their shopping carts and I saw more than a few with six and seven and eight bottles of wine. Lots of wine. That's to anesthetize people. They are in such grieving pain, many of them. Anxiety, stress, unhappiness, uh, misery. I looked around for a happy face. I couldn't find one. And I looked again, and here comes a, a nice-looking middle-aged woman. There were eight bottles of wine in her food cart. Yeah. Sure. You know, and, and, and these are all the ripple effects, and I lay the blame on this, for all of this, on the hands of the bloody bankers of the Federal Reserve. They're doing this. And, um, and of course, you know, the, the, the media and the movies and the TV, oh, my God, it's, it's all poison. You have to, you know, uh, <clears throat> we talked about the leaderless revolution. And part of my revolution is to try and do things with other people that are uplifting. So I'll teach a class on Tai Chi in the park. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have people come from literally hundreds of miles away to spend an afternoon with me in my canoe. Um, I create a small Zen garden and we sit outside and, and, uh, you know, and have a coffee and talk about philosophy. I mean, we need to, you know, do something to fight against all this depression and all that. You know, I, so, you know, so one other thing, so sad. And what you're doing is so good for people. The point here is most of us, and I speak in general terms here, are so addicted to their smartphones, their tablets, their computers, their big screen TV, their sports all diversions they are so addicted the mind is fully engaged at all times with outside stimulation that they spend no time like you just described sitting thinking and talking because when you're not always on input you're able to think if you're not being fed things and reacting to them 
you're able to think. You're alone with your thoughts, or at least with the like-minded people with your thoughts. People don't think anymore. This is a generalization, but they basically re they go through life reacting to carefully contrived, and you talk about toxic, stimulations of millions of types. That's what they're that's what they're addicted to. Go ahead. Yeah. And it's all poison, you know. And the other thing is to spend as much time in nature as you can. I, I, I sit out in the garden so much that I've trained the local chipmunks to jump in my hand. <laughs> and well, I'm good for you. That's that, that's that's nice. But you're putting out energy. They they're they're smart. They understand. They sense it. Uh, I, here's here's one thing that that you left out of of the production and i understand why and it was good that you did if you had put in the issue of illegal aliens uh the united nations refugee resettlement program which is bringing in around the clock uh third world stone age people from the middle east and sub-saharan africa with 65 iqs it's not their fault these are just scientific facts we've got 150,000 somalians in minneapolis for god's sakes they're never going to assimilate never when, when the trucks stop running, they will revert immediately to their bush lifestyle. They'll eat anything they can, including cannibalism is alive and well in Africa. We'll hear more about that in our next hour. But the idea, and this has always bothered me, and I've talked about it endlessly on this program, of this government, this alleged representative government of the people, giving away our life's blood to non-citizens who are being brought in here against our will is outrageous. Billions and billions and billions, ultimately probably a trillion dollars over the decades spent for what? On non-citizens, housing, medical, food, dental, education, cars, spending money, you name it, and we're giving it to these people. While Americans go hungry and homeless, this is treason of the highest order. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jeff. And, you know, here in Canada, it's even worse. You know, I, I left California because I was escaping diversity. And I thought, well, I'll go back to the great white north. Now, I had been away from the great white north for, you know, 15 years. I come back here. It's the great brown north. I, I moved to the whitest community in in Ontario, which is notorious for being a wasp community. And as usual, I like to spend a lot of time walking in the park. I go to the local park, I don't see any white people, Jeff. Um, every once in a while, I'll see, you know, a white couple, and I am so tempted to run up to them and say, oh my God, you're white. Are there any more like you? You know, because mm -hmm. in 15 years, mm -hmm. Jeff, it's gone from, you know, and I grew up in a country where I never saw a person of color. There were no blacks. There was no uh, um, Pakis or Indians or, you know, we, we hardly we, even we, any I, Latinos. I, I, it's it's just it was like this is a Caucasian culture, a Caucasian society. Yes, I understand all about the, the hideous, unforgivable slaughter, the Holocaust of indigenous peoples. I get that. But that's that was then. This is now. This is and now. what's happening now, the minorities and the communists and the leftists and the, the crazy lunatic professors say it's white man's just reward. War on whites. Whites must be destroyed. Uh, and this is being talked about openly now in the media. Oh, I yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I've never owned slaves, Jeff. Nobody in my family ever did. No, Nobody ever but it's your did. fault, no. Stefan. It's your fault. Don't but forget it. My it. Fault. And you need to pay those, uh, every African American, you need to pay them for slavery. This is crazy. This is the kind of non-logic that we're being fed all the time. Uh, it, well, it, it, it's, it's nuts. cultural Marxism designed to destroy our culture. That's what it is. You got it. So I know we're almost out of time, Jeff, and I wanted to offer one more um, way of looking at things, and that's about preparing. Because when I bring this subject up to people about getting ready, they think it's like, first of all, a big deal and that you're being paranoid. 
and they can't do it. Um, but Wait a minute. Are, when you go outside and you put shoes and socks on your feet so you don't cut your feet, uh, freeze your toes in the winter, is that paranoia? No, that's preparing. For God's well, sakes. Depends if you're talking to a social justice warrior or not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but the way I look at it, pre pre getting prepared is like an insurance policy. But it's better than an insurance policy because if nothing bad happens, you get all your money back. You know, I got my driver's license on my 16th birthday 48 years ago. And every year since then, I've been paying for car insurance. Now, I have never had a car accident. I have never had an insurance claim. So my 46 years of payments to the insurance company. Mm -hmm. I don't own a house, but I bought the insurance company a house. <laughs> oh, you bought them more than that, you bet. Right? Yep. Now, because I've been a good driver, not even a speeding ticket, I'm, I'm, I'm golden, you know. Did I get my money back? Did these guys invite me out to dinner and say, thanks for buying me a house? No, that money is gone and it's gone forever. Now, Let's say you buy six months' worth of food from Humana. It's good for 20 years. You hang on to it. Five years from now, Jesus descends from the clouds, creates a, a paradise on earth. You don't need the emergency food. You can still eat it. Numana, N-U-M-A-N-N-A, uh, -N -N is, is the best. And they even have organic food. I've got it. That's what I've got. And... You're right. You're so right. Think about all the property tax, homeowners insurance, flood insurance. Uh, what do you Health get back? Fire. Auto insurance. What do you get back? Nothing. Nothing. If this were an equitable, just, moral system, there would be a merit system by way of your description. No tickets, no accidents. You're entitled to recover, let's say, 50% of all the premiums you've paid. I could retire. <laughs> you could, and that's the way it should be. Social yeah. Security is being looted as we speak. We know that. We're $22 million in debt. Never get out of it. 50 million American young people have student loan debt now. 60, 75,000. I forget what the average is now. They'll never get out of it. They're indentured servants and slaves to this system. Uh, we are not investing in our future. We are indenturing our future yeah. with these student loans and it is uh, it couldn't be more odious or evil it just couldn't be it's all set up you know to 20 years ago I never imagined it yeah yeah so that's you know that's the, the viewpoint you should go into for the listeners is this is an insurance policy if nothing happens you can still eat the food you're not out any money but if something does happen, it's just saved your life. Same thing. Okay, so buy a shotgun. You know, get a Mossberg 500, 250 at the at the big five. You know, what's 250? It's nothing, right? No, nah, nothing. I, I, yes, Remington 870, probably the best shotgun ever made. I, I uh, went from a 12 to a 20 gauge. Uh, it's easier for women to handle. It's just about as good yes. as a 12. Uh, it, yeah. The point is. That's that's probably the overall first weapon of choice to defend yourself. Yeah, if I would were to advise people, and like I said, I've been a prepper for a long time. Yeah, I would say first gun to buy a shotgun. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you buy the shotgun, you're out 250 bucks, and it turns out that the Smalling uh, uh, families that moved in next door are really nice guys. They invite you over every day for a goat barbecue. Afterwards, they uh, bring up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the string quartet, and they play Beethoven, and followed by uh -huh. a sudden death round of uh, chess. Yeah. Great. You don't need your shotgun. But, you know, you can always sell it again. Yeah. Those weapons don't lose oh, their Oh, no, it's in totally a 100% right? safe and secure, wonderful investment. Uh, it's a tool. It's, a it's like having a, a toolbox, but you got no tools in it. It's another tool, like a screwdriver or a, uh, a wrench. It's a tool. This tool is to protect you and your loved ones, okay? And that's the only thing keeping us at this point from suffering massive gang rapes, crime like Europe has
has been overrun with. Europeans lost their right to bear arms. That's why they are being destroyed. Oh, it's and tragic. It's, I mean, I've traveled throughout yeah. Europe many times. I loved Europe. Um, and also, folks, remember, whatever happens, there will be no police. There will be no ambulance. There will be no fire department. So, <laughs> you know... Um, no 9-11 calls. By the way, there are no laws on the books in most states that require any law enforcement, fire, or emergency services people to respond to a 9-11 call. It's, it's not a law that they have to. They do. It's their job. But they don't have to. So keep yeah. that in mind, too. And then, you know, the other thing is stockpile any medications that you need to take. So if you're a diabetic or, you know, you have a heart condition, mm -hmm. you know, get three months worth of that medication because, again, in any scenario, EMP, World War Three, financial collapse, all that's going to be gone. So you need your medication and um, get a generator, get a diesel generator. They're like 450 bucks. Yamaha makes a really good one. A diesel? You know, $450 for a diesel generator. I didn't know this. They're small. They don't have a lot of wattage, but it'll be enough to keep the fridge running and, and run the computer, you know. Yeah. All right. And, uh, good. Name, and, name and, a brand. You got a brand name you want to mention? No, I don't. Uh, there's uh, some it, good ones out there, but I, I agree with you about diesel. Uh, yeah. Much better than gasoline. Yeah, because it runs on anything, right? If it's, it's built properly, yes. It'll run on yeah. vegetable oil. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we had the power jet outage where I lived, the uh, the condominium company came in and they set up uh, electric generators mm -hmm. and we had to. But you know what? Um, almost nobody in the uh, uh, complex could take advantage of it because they didn't have extension cords. <laughs> oh, how <laughs> ironic. Generator. How ironic. All right, Stefan, thank you very much for doing what you've done. Uh, we'll talk to you again and I, I hope a lot of people listen to the video and pass it around. It's uh, it's just essential information. Thank you, Steph. Thank, thank you, Jeff, so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Okay. Good night. Good night. Stefan Verstappen, V-E-R-S-T-A-P-P-E-N, and his video is right under his name in guests.